I just want to introduce Mike Weber. Um, he's a lead trainer um, at SpiderTools.com, and um, he'll be talking about choosing plugins uh, with Nagios. Uh, thank you, everyone. Okay, how many of you guys are using Nagios uh, Core? Wow, that's amazing. Um, many of the new people coming are going to XI. Now, not to say, I think Core is a, a great option if I was going to set up. Um, if you know the command line, you're set. And if you're struggling there, then you got some problems. One of the problems that uh, is very common in when we're doing training is people make choices that they regret. Now, I've talked to a bunch of people already and they say, you know, several people have told me, oh, our configurations are the worst. We've got a disaster happening. We don't know what to do. The problem is, is there's no way to know where you're going to go with your Nagio setup. There's a lot of administrators that I talk to that the management says, hey, let's just do this little bit of uh, monitoring. And it was so successful that it expanded way beyond. But the management forgot to tell them, we're not going to give you any more money. You've got to crank it out of that little piece of junk that we gave you in the first place. So there's a lot of problems. And so choosing plugins is a really an important aspect. I, I thought about this, uh, this particular session from a comment that I had from one of my students. Uh, he was a, a Nagus administrator in Africa. His company was rolling out uh, wireless internet in Africa. And you can just imagine the infrastructure in Africa is wild. Uh, but his boss said, we need to check everything within uh, one minute. All of our intervals are one minute. We, this is all critical stuff. So his question was, um, can I do 500 checks per second? Now, when you think about that, certainly you can do that with the right resources hardware-wise. But the issue is bigger than that because he was actually asking the wrong question. And this is why. You have to think about the fact that many Nagios plugins hold the resources, for example, like check ping, three seconds. So when you say, we need to do 500 checks per second, really what you're asking is we need to do 1,500 checks per second because we're using a lot of ping. There are plugins out there that hold the resources for 10 seconds. So in those kinds of situations, I mean, when you're evaluating what plugin do you want to use, it's not only talking about security, talking about uh, ease of setup, but it also means, hey, are you going to be able to do this? Do you have the resources to be able to complete the checks? Because if a check takes 10 minutes, or sorry, 10 seconds to complete, this is going to be a significant problem for you. So we're going to look at this and um, look at some, some of these options here. These are the things I want to look at in terms of identifying some of the options. And I want you to uh, interrupt me if you have questions, because I want to ask the, you know, answer, help answer your questions as we go along. But Public port monitoring. Just mo monitoring a port. Is a port up? I mean, this is a pretty simple process. It gives you some information, but it's probably not everything you want. NRPE, Nagios Remote Plug Executor. So here, this type of plugin, you place, uh, you're executing your plugins on the remote box. Of course, there's advantages. You're putting all the load on the remote box, not your Nagios server. Uh, and then they execute and then returns the information. You've got SSH. Of course, with SSH, you've got secure connections, secure data transfer. So if you're in a uh, hostile environment, you want to think about using SSH. 
Uh, NS Client, if you've got Windows, NS Client gives you the option to use uh, check NRPE, check um, NT, and some other options if you wanted to use those. So if you want to look at that. NSCA, Nagia Service Check Acceptor. This is a passive check. Now, when we talk about passive versus active, in an active check, Nagios initiates the connection. Nagios says, okay, it's time to go, go to the remote host, collect the information, and return it. In a passive check, the host initiates the action. So you got a cron job on that host, or you have a security event on that host, generates the information, and sends it to Nagios. Nagios has no idea when that's going to come. And so there's some problems that develop from that kind of situation. Now, NSCA is the, as Ethan mentioned this morning, is the older passive way of doing things. The newer way is NRDP. And it, it saves on some resources, and it's easier to set up. So there are some advantages there. So if you're thinking about passive checks, if you, for example, if you're do monitoring a, a host that's behind a firewall, maybe the firewall guys won't poke you a hole through the firewall, so you can't, you can't use NRPE. So then you've got to set a script on that box that will send it through that firewall, and they don't have to modify the firewall. And then good old SNMP. SNMP is a great option, and uh, it does mean that you've got to come up to speed on some basic things, but it gives you some information you can't get any other way. And so it's a valuable <laughs> tool as well. Okay, so the criteria we want to look at is how easy is it to set up? Now, the one thing I really want to focus on here is this is the worst problem that people can make. Choose a plugin because it's the easiest that usually will come back to bite you. Um, I know that you have situations where the management says, we need to get this going quickly. Have you ever heard that? <laughs> and so as a Nagus administrator who's struggling how to figure this all out, well, if you can run check ping, then you can say to them, hey, look, it's working. I understand that. But in the end, some of those choices that you make because they're easy can oftentimes come back and bite you uh, because of the resources. You don't get the information you really need, those kinds of things. Uh, network topology. Your network may be a kind of situation that requires a specific kind of plug-in. You're not going to use UDP across the WAN link because it's not going to be very reliable. So you're going to make choices depending upon your network topology. Security. Uh, security becomes, I mean, I saw the paper today, uh, right on the front page, and everything in the world's getting hacked, and that doesn't make you feel so good when you're at an obvious conference and you're worried about your stuff. Uh, security becomes more and more important, and so there are plugins that will provide you better security and are going to give you the same abilities to do what you want. Uh, and then the important thing I, I want to make sure that we focus on is resource usage. There's some things I want to tell you about resource usage of plugins so you don't make an easy mistake that you could avoid. Uh, avoiding some of these plugins uh, or at least thinking about some of these plugins that could really uh, take away your resources. Here's the four principles I want to teach you about plugins. If, if these, the, these four are the only four things you get out of this session, then memorize these things because they're going to they're gonna help you as an administrator. Number one, poor choices in implementing plugins cannot be compensated by purchasing bigger and bigger and bigger hardware. You're going to run out of money. You can make some poor choices that you're not going to be able to buy your way out of. And so making good choices about the types of plugins you implement initially
can save tremendous amount of resources. Secondly, hey, if you have to choose plugins, think ahead. Execute the plugin on the host. Use SSH, use NRD, uh, use um, NRPE, or NRD, NRDP NSCA, passive active options. You have a lot of different options you can use to execute plugins on the host. That does create some issues. It's more complex, I understand that. Um, I was talking to somebody at the conference last night who is executing millions and millions of checks telling me that they're going to try to push everything to active because when things are passive, you're, you're working with all these scripts. You know, versions update, uh, OS updates, you're always messing with scripts and that, yeah, I understand. Um, the third thing here, Compiled plugins require 10 to 44 times less resources than scripts. Perl, Bash, whatever you have. So the point there is, if you're going, if you can do something two ways, choose a compiled plugin. Because you will be able to do a whole lot more down the road than if you are saying, hey, we can write Perl scripts, and so we're going to do everything with Perl scripts. Sure, but you're going to have to buy a lot bigger hardware because it's going to take a lot of resources. Plugin RAM plus Nagios RAM times time is going to give you some idea about how much RAM you need. So what I'm saying is when you think about how much memory do I need in my system to estimate if we're going to do 100,000 checks or whatever the number is, you're going to have to think about the connection that you have with Nagios to be able to generate the check and then how long that check is going to take. You've got to be thinking that a check that takes three seconds is going to take three times as much more uh, memory than one that just executes and is over. It may give you some ideas about making choices. And then there are some plugins, uh, check IF traffic, holds those resources for 10 seconds. And so that's going to be a pretty big uh, resource hog on your system. Now I'm not saying not to use those, but I am saying think about that because you may want to make some initial, initial decisions. Okay, ease of setup. Easiest thing in the world to do is uh, monitor public ports. Check TCP. Your argument, port 25, port 22, port 80. You know what ports are? You know that you don't know much more beyond that, but you know something's happening on the port, okay? Uh, so public port monitoring is the easiest route to go. It can get you started. And uh, there are some options with Check TCP, for example, that you can uh, log in, you can do different things. It's all plain text, but it's an easy way to get started. NRPE is a great way to get started as well. NRPE is a situation where you set up a daemon on the host that you want to monitor, or better, called an agent on the remote host. That remote host then, you're going to want to modify the permission so only Nagios can use that daemon. Don't slide on the security here because you're going to pay for it. Somebody gets inside your network and they find out you're running uh, Nagios or NRP, some of those things. Uh, I can tell you some pretty wild stories. I can tell you about uh, the Windows administrator that had a Linux box monitoring 50 Windows servers, and he didn't secure his Nagios box, and he got hacked. Those 50 Windows servers were the entire company that somebody owned. How he kept his job, I don't know. But 
you, you've got to be thinking about those things whenever you make these decisions. Um, NS Client is for Windows, and so we're going to look at that briefly. And uh, it's pretty simple to set up and use. You can use Check NRP or Check NT, as well as many other options with the NS Client. So if you're looking at Windows, that's probably one of the better options. SSH, of course. And I'm going down the list in terms of difficulty. SSH, more secure. You've got to set up keys. You've got to uh, set up permissions with Navios. And so as we go down the list, they become more difficult. NRDP is that passive method of putting the script on the remote host. It executes and then sends the information to Navios whenever, uh, whenever it's supposed to. That's all done on the client. And so that is more difficult. Um, NS, um, NRDP is easier than NSCA. So that's the one that I would recommend. The other thing is, is if you have passive checks and you're using the older NSCA, you have to set up a daemon on Nagios to accept that information. With NRDP, you do not. It goes through port 80, comes in as XML, and then uh, it's processed there. So it's a lot easier to uh, make that happen. OK, and then SNMP, of course, is uh, a little rougher experience. OK, advantages of public ports, they're easy to set up. No firewall issues. Don't have to modify anything. But the disadvantages? You're limited on the information you can get. Anything you w use in terms of passwords or text, it's all plain text. And so easy, but probably not going to get you the solution you want. NRPE. With NRPE, you can use plugins on that remote host. You take all your Nagios plugins, you put them there, and you can execute them and use them on that remote host. Great option. Um, you can write your own scripts. NRPE will do all that for you. Um, pretty simple to set up and execute. Uh, disadvantages, you do have to set up a daemon, and you're looking, in most of the cases, plain text. NS client, again, easy to set up. You can do pretty much whatever you want to do on that Windows box. You can write scripts. You can check things. Uh, you can check on RPE, check NT, like I said. Uh, you can use other programming scripts and tie it in there. It's got uh, ties to Lua, if you know Lua, whatever. So there's a lot of options that you could use there. The disadvantages of SNS client is that you do have to set up a, um, the daemon. You do have password authentication, but that uh, password authentication is pretty weak. Uh, if you're worried about security, you're going to want to do something to enhance that security. SSH, um, everybody knows it's encrypted, so a great advantage. The one thing you have to think about with SSH, the disadvantage. Remember, Nagios is executing the plugins. Nagios does not have the rights to execute everything that you may want. For example, Nagios has no access, to, uh, doesn't have much access to logs. And so you're going to have to make some modifications. You may have to use VI sudo to give Nagios the ability to execute the things that you want. This then may turn SSH into a security liability by allowing Nagios to do too much. And this is a decision you've got to make, is that VI sudo is is uh, an option, but it can bite you if, if you're not careful. So there is kind of a balance with SSH there. But all of that does make it a little bit more difficult to set up. NRDP, uh, again, here we're looking at ports 80 or port 443. If you use encryption on your, your Nagios server, your web interface, hey, NRDP then is pretty secure because you're going through port 443. If you use just port 80, yeah, you lose some advantages because 
it's going to come over plain text. You do have um, a password connection there, but it's not going to be as secure as maybe you want. Uh, NSCA, uh, any of you using NSCA currently? Okay, passive checks. They're not the easiest thing to implement. Um, if you do decide to use passive checks, the key to remember with passive checks is detail. Don't slide anything on detail. It's the detail that is going to bite you with passive checks. Everything you do, think about case sensitivity, execute the script, become the Nagios user, execute the script as Nagios to see what kind of feedback you get. Uh, but NSCA, the, the biggest problem is not paying attention to detail. Uh, and that's where you, because it's, it's so finely tuned that any kind of mistake uh, is not going to let you through. Okay, here's an illustration. NSCA and NRDP. These are both passive methods that you could use. The advantage of passive methods is anything that your organization wants to monitor, they can execute a script, write a script, execute it, and send it to Nagios. You have the ability to do absolutely anything you want to. And so you can see that NSCA sends it back to Nagios on port 5667. Um, it does have a, it has a password and it is encrypted. You can choose your level of encryption. With NRDP, it can go across the, the connection on 443, so you have your encryption, and it's a lot easier to set up. Uh, the scripting, if you have scripts, you can, if you, if you were using passive scripts and you're using the old NSCA, doesn't take much to change the scripts to NRDP. Uh, and make that work that way. It, NRDP uses less resources as well on the Nagio server. What's the stop somebody from uh, sending uh, false data across by NRDP? Nagio is basically listening to anything. Nagio should not be listening to anything. Nagio well, should only be listening to, and this is where you want to set up your firewall, but also with, um, you're talking about NRP? Uh, no, NRDP. Okay, NRDP. Um, they have, there's a security token. Okay. You set up a token so that that token then is going to tie into their ability to connect up to Nagios. Okay. That's so a good question. So you, you do need to send a token across to... The token does come across, functions as a password. Now, you would have to set up that token with all of the hosts. Okay. So it's got to be a pretty complex token. Okay, that's what I was wondering. Yeah, yeah. Good question, though, because port 80 is typically pretty ugly. Okay. Uh, and then SNMP, SNMP takes some understanding. It takes configuration. Uh, if you're monitoring a switch or a router, you've got to set up a community stream. You've got to give yourself access. You have to know something. And sometimes that knowing something is not a very fun process. But it does provide you information that is valuable. You don't want to you don't want to push this aside. This is probably not your first choice, but it's something that down the road you want to implement because there are things that are great advantages on it. Okay, so ease of setup. I really think this is the worst reason to decide on which plugin to use is because it's easy. Because two years down the road, you're going to say, I wish I would have. Now, I understand, again, if you have management that says, today, you have to show them something. The other tip I would give you is you don't have to know all this stuff. Pick one method. Say, OK, we, we, we don't want to focus on SSH. Uh, we can do all this securely with NRPE. Focus on learning NRPE so that you've got that down and don't try to learn everything at the same time because you're going to find yourself overwhelmed. Uh, there's just too many options out there. Uh, network topology. 
Uh, do you have an internal network, a VPN? Do you have a network uh, that's looking at the internet and all of the possibilities there? And dealing with firewalls, it's not so much if the firewall's there, is will somebody listen to you when you say, hey, we need to open up port 5666 or 5667 or whatever? If they won't listen to you, you're going to have to make a different choice because the network perimeter guys may not give you the things that you want or need. So on an internal network, hey, use whatever you want. Um, that's, you know, if, if you're in a secure situation, uh, you can choose options and not worry too much about uh, anything else. Um, so that's not really a decision that uh, takes too much thinking. If you're on a public network, you're going to want to really take some serious considerations. Any of you got your Nagios implementation over a public network? A couple of you. Yeah. I typically, in the classes that I do, I typically see 25% have their Nagios installation and it's ac accessible by internet. Um, you really have to be careful. Um, so if you use public ports, you don't have to deal with firewalls, you don't have to do much configuration, um, it's pretty secure, but you don't get a whole lot of information back. Not the greatest option. SSH. SSH, again, a little difficult to implement, but you do have that security. So if security is an issue, you really only have these three or four options, SSH, NSCA, or NRDP. Um, and so those, it de kind of depends. If you're going to do active, then you're going to be looking at SSH. If you're going to be doing passive, that's where the, the check executes on the client, and the client sends the information to Nagios and Nagios never really knows when stuff's going to come. That's the passive. If you're going to do that, you're going to have to use N NSCA or NRDP. So uh, those are the, the basic options you have there. But whatever you do, your Nagios server must receive some special attention because you have a lot of issues. If you have a Nagios core, um, you, you have issues, certainly. But remember, one of the things that I put here at the bottom, mod security, anybody using mod security? Okay. All right, so mod security is not an easy way to implement things. But mod security is a golden option if you can endure the pain, and you think SNMP is bad, mod security is kind of in the same category. But one of the things you have to think about as a administrator, when you have any machine that's listening on port 80 or 443, anything can come down that port. Anything. Cross-site scripting, uh, malware attacks, uh, you know, anything can come through that port. And one of the things that mod security does is it parses everything and blocks all that stuff that is not supposed to be coming. You have zero day exploit protection. So even running Nagios, there's a possibility. Somebody detects a, uh, an exploit with mod security, you have that protection immediately. And so one of the projects I'm actually working on now is trying to set up mod security and get kind of a standard and set it up on core and XI so that those rules could be rolled out and somebody could implement that in a little bit easier fashion. Uh, because it, remember, the logs that you see when you look at your HTTP logs, those logs are only a very small part of what's actually happening. Uh, access information is not all that's happening on your, your web interface. So anyway. Uh, be careful with that. Uh, TCP wrappers um, is an option. Any of you use TCP wrappers? Okay. Yee. 
yikes. So you want to be thinking about that. Um, I think that even using TCP wrappers on an internal system, hey, it's a little bit extra work, but gives you some uh, level of protection. Okay, I'll show you some examples of some things here in a second. So the security of Nagios, uh, there are factors that either elevate or degrade your security on Nagios. So if you have a Nagios that's sitting on the internet, you want to be making choices that give you the most potential for security. And I know that those choices are all hard. There's no easy security solutions. They just don't exist. And so you do have to be careful about that. You have to, have to think about the security of the client uh, and also anything that's transferred over the network. So SSH, now with SSH, again, uh, you're probably going to set this up with an empty password or at empty key phrase because you've got to set up keys so that you can communicate and somebody's not sitting there typing in commands. Um, and so you just have to know that up front. This is a, a great way to encrypt things and do things, but because you're automating things, you're going to lose some security. And then you can see the example I have here of uh, Nagios. This is a command in VI sudo. Is Nagios is going to be able to, without a password, execute that command. So if you expand Nagios's ability to execute more and more commands, your security is going to go downhill. And so SSH. Though it's secure, you make some of these choices and you expand it. I've seen a lot of SSH connections where administrators have given Nagios the ability to execute any command. Well, Nagios has become root. Not really very smart. And so you really have to be careful with this because you can go overboard and cause yourself In SCA, it's not the easiest to set up. And this is the passive option again. Uh, you've got a daemon to set up on Nagios, your Nagios server. So you've got to take that daemon and you've got to restrict that daemon so it can only talk to the clients that are sending information. So you've just punched a hole in your firewall to your Nagios server. Now, that's versus punching a firewall in front of the box that you're trying to get access to, if that's the case. So whenever you punch those holes in the firewall, you've got some, some issues. NRDP. And here is an example of uh, that again, so that you can see that NRDP is just a little bit easier because a lot of those features, you don't have to set up a daemon. You're using a port that's already open, and so that makes it a little bit easier. Uh, here's an illustration of mod security. So you got port 80, and your firewall says, OK, we restricted everything but port 80. What you don't realize sometimes is that everything in the planet that you're wanting to restrict is coming through port 80. You have no restrictions, nothing. You're just leaving those people out there to try anything they want. And if that's happening on your Nagios server, of course, it won't take long before they'll figure out something that'll cause you grief. Um, and so I have um, a, number of Na a number of Nagios servers, but um, other types of servers that I use mod security on. And looking at the logs just turns your stomach because the bots that are out there, the automated attack features, uh, it's very disturbing. When you actually see what's happening on the ports that, are, that you're using here, uh, it's, uh, it's not, a, not a good thing. Okay, this is what I really want to focus on is uh, resource issues. And we're going to talk about resource issues with Nagio specifically. So when we talk about resource, um, of course your Nagios server is running, and you've got a basic operating system, uh, ops, 
CentOS or Red Hat typically is what you're using. And then you've got these support avenues. Uh, maybe you have a MySQL, a Postgres, a Apache web server, of course. So you've got all those issues. Those are all givens, and those are going to take a certain amount of your resources on your, your box. Then you have plugins. And you also have to think about the resources that Nagios is using itself to execute the plugin. Uh, and I haven't added in here, if there is a critical state, then you're sending an alert. So what else are you doing? You're generating that mail server that, to send out that information. So you've got more resources that go there. So there are some other factors as well. Uh, here's a script that I used. Um, and the script is, is important, but just to give you an idea of what I did, is I set up a, a Nagus core, and I set it up to, uh, I think I was doing, uh, I, don't know, I can't remember, 1,500 checks per five minutes or 1,000 or something, I can't remember. But then just recording all the information I could about the processes that were happening, about, I was really interested in RAM, I was interested in CPU, and one thing I didn't think about was time. Uh, I never thought about, I never really looked into specifically how long some of these plugins take to execute. And then putting that into some kind of equation for where, what are my limits with this limit of hardware. So that's, that's the actual script. Um, and it creates a couple files. Uh, it actually records every second, everything that's happening on Nagios, so you get a one second uh, uh, blink of everything that's happening. So here's some of the output, and this is where um, you'll see some things that maybe will cause you to think a little bit, is the output, the first thing I was trying to do is the PID, that's the process of ID, but I also wanted to ca uh, capture the parent I wanted to know what this process was connected to because that's going to take into account some of my resource needs. My CPU, my RAM, and uh, there are a lot of different ways to, I use PS to capture this information. There's different ways to capture the RAM. The command that I used, the option, was to try to capture just the memory that was needed to execute the script. Some of the when you look at some of those options with memory, you capture a lot more. So you'll see some variances there. So whatever method you use to capture RAM, just be consistent with that to make comparisons. But your numbers are going to be a little different. Uh, but the command is in that script. So here you can see the first thing that I found, and a lot of you guys know this already, but the compiled plugins don't take hardly any resources. So if I have a compiled plugin, here's an example, check HTTP. There's my, uh, my host. And there I'm trying to read a text on a web page. That takes the same amount as if I was checking Tomcat and checking for uh, warning and critical states. Same amount of resources. So the, the thing that was interesting in looking at this is when you use compiled plugins, they're going to use the same amount of resources every time. The advantage is you can estimate. If we're going to double our checks, do we have resources? If you're using compiled plugins, hey, you can figure that out. You can come pretty close to making a very good estimate of what you can do. Um, this also, here's, here's ping. Um, there's, uh, here's NRPE. So there's the command that it's executing remotely. So you can see that check NRPE uses more. These are kilobytes. And so you are looking at a lot of different options there. So here's um, check TCP. It doesn't matter what port it's monitoring. It's always the same. So that's one thing is you have to consider the fact that compiled plugins are the way to go. I'm not saying you can't use anything else, but you're going to find that there are some big differences. Here's some more compiled plugins. Here's uh, check MySQL. 
here's the user Nagios, the database Nagios, the password. It uses the same thing if you're using a complex options or simple options. It uses the same resources. You can count on it. You can estimate from it. You can evaluate where you want to go. Uh, check SSH. Check SSH. And so here's SSH looking at a key and doing that. Um, using uh, executing a re remote command and check multi. Any of you using check multi? Okay, here's the bottom line. If you want to save resources, use check multi. Check multi works with SSH, NRP, or locally. What it does is instead of making 30 connections to a box using SSH to execute one command at a time, it connects one time, executes all 30, and returns it back to the Nagios. You just cut your resource usage by 300% by using Check Multi. Easy to implement. And by the way, if, if you have questions on, if you say, hey, yeah, that Check Multi sounds good. Uh, I got a business card up here. Take my business card, send me an email, say, hey, um, do you have a config for Check Multi? I'll send you a PDF. Uh, it's just a great option to be able to save resources. Works with SSH, NRPE, or locally on your Nagios box. So it is uh, a nice option. It's the one option that's going to save you a lot in terms of resources. The other thing here, you can see the last example, check SNMP. Uh, notice that I've got the MIB the dash M and then the MIB name, and then the dash O is the OID, and it's in numerical value. Those will save you resources. If you are using SNMP, include the MIB. Otherwise, you're forcing Nagios to load all those MIBs and search through to find the right one. Tell Nagios where you're going. Use the numerical value if you can deal with it, because that will save a little bit of resources. But the MIB, issue saves you the most in that, that option. Okay, now look at this comparison. Now I'm not picking on Perl, it's the same with Bash or any other language. Look at the differences that we're looking at. Here is a command check SNMP load RAM 5452. The other one's with 300. Look at the CPU. The other ones didn't even register on CPU. Here's it's using 1%. Now, <coughs> this is not a high-powered box that I did the test on, but it's not a piece of junk either. Question? Are you using the embedded kernel with that or those are separate processes? Yeah, that's, that's a good point. This was not uh, the embedded kernel. Yeah. So in your experience, what would be the difference that you would see? You I don't even pay attention. Yeah. It would be, I didn't even think about that. That's a good question, though, because that could make some difference here. Well, I'm however. With, with web applications, it can make an enormous difference. It, it basically puts Perl scripts on par with, um, with compiled scripts because the Perl is already uh, loaded in the, in the web server, or in this case, the Nagios process. So. That's a great uh, tip. Um, I, I would say that I did do this with other kind of bash, for example, and you get pretty similar output. But that is a, a great thing that you'll want to um, look at. So I will put that down to uh, uh, look into that because that'd be an interesting comparison. But these numbers are pretty astounding uh, in terms of differences. So if your organization, if somebody says to you, hey, can we run 5,000 checks? Well, what are those checks? Are they check NRPE, check SSH, or are they Perl scripts that are going to execute and drive us into the ground? The difference is going to be big, eh? So what would you Okay, no, well, these, for example, these are just Perl scripts. They're not compiled. That's the difference. If you have a compiled plugin, choose that first because you're going to save yourself a lot of agony 
in terms of your box. One of the most common issues is, hey, I can't scale. We've got to do something. We're running out of resources. We don't know what to do. We've got to buy a new box, all those kinds of things. Um, so that uh, the, the previous session I did uh, one on check IMAP receive, well, you can see this, this baby is a hog compared to the other ones. But let's face it. There may not be a compiled script for, or a compiled plugin that will do what you want. So, okay. But if you have a choice, go towards those compiled. Make those your first option. When you're trying to figure out what your organization wants to do, where they want to go, focus on that, and then take the others as, as options. Uh, here's some more examples. Uh, this is NS client, which is compiled. And so you can see the numbers are back down. 280, nothing showing up on CPU. And it doesn't matter what you do here. It doesn't matter if you're uh, looking at process states, disk usage, uh, something simple, something complex. Same amount of resources you can count on. Uh, here's SSH using uh, check, uh, executing remote uh, commands, but it's accessing a key and pretty, pretty low. Now, here's the principle. Poor choices on implementing plugins cannot be compensated by additional hardware. You can't buy your way out of these problems eventually. You're just gonna get some kind of limitations. So, some kind of knowledge of plugins some kind of time to sit down and evaluate and figure out what you want to do, uh, you're going to avoid this domino effect. And the domino effect is one of those things where Nagius can't execute it, so it rolls it into the next second, and the next second, and the next second, and the dominoes begin to fall, and you got problems. Because you roll it too far, and the check's going to execute again. And you know what happens there. Your latency increases, and you just can't keep going. Principle number two, and this is what I mentioned before. If you can, execute the scripts on a remote host. That means it's a little more difficult to set up. But you're going to be able to deal with scalability better. Uh, I would say this. You, there are options, DNX, Mod Gearman, options to offload the work from Nagios onto workers. That's another option if you're, you're really dealing with scale issues, and those are pretty easy to set up and pretty effective. There's a comparison. It gives you a chart. On the left, We've got compiled plugins. Why do you think Nagios pushes the compiled plugins you get automatically when you install it? They know, hey, some of these are not so great. And so some of those Perl plugins, and uh, Perl, Bash, probably any kind of language you want to use, you're going to have very pretty similar issues. 44 times difference. So you spend $10,000 on a server, and how are you going to explain to the administration that uh, you're not getting what you need? Okay. Plug-in RAM plus Nagios RAM times time. So, for example, if check ping takes three seconds, <coughs> you've got 280 RAM from check ping. You've got RAM from the Nagios plug-in. Uh, the nog is to execute it, and it takes three seconds, so you're going to have to take that times three. So uh, just trying to create some kind of way for you to think about uh, evaluating w how much further you can go with your plugins. Here's an example of the parent relationship so that when you're doing this, this uh, check ping has got a parent uh, tied to nog is. So here's the check ping time. You can run the command, you can see. One second, two seconds, three seconds. So it's obviously taking the time. So this time is one of the factors in that script that I wanted to evaluate is try to figure out, okay, how long is it tying up the resources that I need? 
Look at this one, uh, check I have traffic. It measures uh, traffic bandwidth. This is a common Perl plugin. Uh, it's a great plugin, but look at the RAM that it uses for 10 seconds, and then look at the CPU. On this machine, it took 13% of the CPU in the first second. Now, it went downhill from there, but still, how many of these can you ex execute at one time? That may determine a little bit about some of your decisions. And so, there's some of these plugins, they have great features that you want, but you may not be able to live with. Okay. Questions? It will come, you get a PDF of this whole thing, <coughs> and you have it in there. You can get my card. If you have questions, I'd be happy to answer anything you want to. Uh, and it's not a perfect script, but it gives you some way to evaluate something. And that evaluation is important. Uh, every company's different. You know, the needs are different. Yeah. You know, I, I evaluated a bunch of plugins, not every plugin, because there's a lot of plugins out there. Um, and what I initially thought is there would be a difference between NRPE and um, NSCA. And the difference is not that how you do the plugin, it's whether it's compiled or not. And that's the biggest difference. So that's where I gave up going in that direction, is because I could see it. If it's compiled, you're good. Yeah. It was probably a dumb question. You were mentioned log security. Mm -hmm. I just think that's an Apache module. It, yes, it's an Apache module you can add, and it's a, um, it, it evaluates everything that comes through and, and actually parses it and has a long list of rules to check to provide uh, security for zero day exploits, for example. Um, all kinds of things. In terms of load, load not not too much load. It doesn't. It's one uh, percent or something. It's pretty low. Um, it's not page you have. To, it's got all these rules, and I'm not talking about three or four rules. I'm talking about hundreds of rules, and so you have to do very thorough testing because all of a sudden something doesn't show up, or you may have a script that is doing something it really shouldn't, and it will stop it from doing that. And so, you know, you have to, you can, uh, you can adjust all the rules on. But it is a great project. It's just not easy to implement. Okay, I think our time is uh, up. Thank you.